Thank you so much for joining us today for me preparing researchers and practitioners to engage in collaborative research hosted by RL Northeastern Islands. At this time, I'd like to introduce Maria Paz Avery, who's the Research Alliance Manager here at RL. We'll be kicking off today's webinar and introducing our speakers. Good afternoon, MP, and have a great webinar. Thanks, Peter. And welcome, everyone. It's good to see some people from within our region and also people from outside our region. We're very happy that you joined us for this webinar, Meeting in the Middle, Preparing Researchers and Practitioners to Engage in Collaborative Research. Um, this is one of a series of six webinars that we have been having. So this is our fifth webinar, and we will be having one more um, before the end of our contract. And we are very pleased that you're here with us to join in this discussion. Um, I'm going to go over quickly our agenda. As you can tell, we're actually in the welcome introduction phase of their agenda. And from that, we will move on to hearing from our two speakers, our first speaker being Laura O'Dwyer, who will be talking to us from the perspective of someone who trains students who will eventually become educational researchers. And then we will be hearing from Jerry Buteau, who's a professor and works primarily in teacher education programs. And he will be sharing some of his perspectives on what is happening in one teacher preparation program that they're running at Plymouth State College University, I'm sorry, and also thinking about what are the kind of skills that um, new teachers need to have in order to be able to work effectively with educational researchers. After the two presentations, we're going to have some time for questions and answers that Rebbe Carey, our deputy director, will be leading. And then we'll have a short wrap up. I think we're going to have a very interesting discussion, as this is a topic that is coming up more and more as we talk about collaboration. Um, the Regional Education Laboratory for the Northeast and Islands is one of 10 regional education laboratories funded by the Institute of Education Sciences. And the, lab, the RELs are tasked with promoting research partnerships through the establishment of research alliances. Our alliances bring together researchers and practitioners to examine mutually identified problems of practice and to build capacity in our region on the use of data to inform decisions related to practice and policy. We have, as Peter mentioned, if you were listening to his introductions, we have eight alliances in the areas of early learning, English language learners, college and career readiness, educator effectiveness, rural education, and urban school improvement. Our goal as the alliances is to build research capacity and a knowledge base um, across the region. And we try to do this by assisting our states, districts, and schools with using their data systems, conducting and supporting high quality research and evaluation, providing opportunities for practitioners to engage with education research, and helping education policy makers and practitioners to incorporate database inquiry practices into the regular decision making. For today, we will be focusing on those three areas that are in green in the slides. Our goals for today will be to consider the challenges to research, to successful research and practitioner collaborations that were introduced in a seminal article by Coburn and her colleagues. We will go over those challenges that they talk about in a minute. We also will take some time to reflect on the skills that future researchers and practitioners are being taught or could be taught during the preparation programs, and to engage in a discussion about the skills and resources and strategies that we should be considering when designing practitioner and researcher preparation programs. One of the things that we assume, and it's definitely verified by the experiences that we've had in working with both practitioners and researchers in education, and that is that we all share a common goal, and that is providing high quality education for all of our students. The thing is, though, that we approach this goal from different perspectives and through different methods. But they really are important per perspectives and methods um, in their own right. But they become very powerful when we succeed in bringing them together. So you have here a picture of what could look like a very shaky looking bridge, certainly one that I would be hesitant walking across 
not being sure I'd get from one end to the other. However, what we're really striving for is that picture on the left, on the right, I'm sorry, um, that really brings together both sides of that maybe ravine or cliff. Um, and that's where the strength is, bringing both sides, both perspectives of the practitioner and researcher to better understand the problems of practice in order to improve the educational experiences of our students. So um, the research that we were referring to earlier from Coburn and her colleagues posits seven challenges to successful research partnerships. In our alliance work over the past four years, we have been striving to meet these seven challenges that were posed in their seminal article. Those challenges have to do with aligning the norms and incentives from both sides, bridging the two cultural worlds of practitioners and researchers, creating relationships of trust, and I can't say how important that is, they really are important, and creating mutually uh, beneficial expectations, as well as balancing local relevance of the, the practices that we study while maintaining depth and rigor in the research. So um, in today's webinar, we, we will be addressing these challenges because although we've been working on meeting those challenges with our current members and alliances, they will continue to be challenges until we really begin to lay the groundwork of collaboration in, in the programs that prepare both practitioners and researchers. So our quick key questions for today are, can preparation programs mitigate some of these challenges? And if so, what skills can be taught to emerging teachers and administrators and researchers to address these challenges? I will introduce to you our two presenters at this point. Oh, oh yep, we do have um, a series of polls, so let me just get Jenny to put those up. Please uh, respond to these polls. Um, if you will notice, those have to do with the challenges that I just mentioned. So which of those do you think are the most challenging? And then which of these do you think are the most teachable? Okay, so we're starting to see some interesting trends here. Um, definitely the most challenging. We're seeing um, that they're showing pretty, <laughs> well, meeting district timelines while maintaining depth and quality of research seems to have the strongest, shows the strongest challenge. The others seem to be pretty equal, although maintaining mutualism doesn't have any doesn't seem to be a challenge, and understanding and negotiating school and district context doesn't seem to be a challenge either. Um, however, that's certainly showing up as not one of the most teachable things, being able to understand the context in which uh, practitioners, uh, researchers might be working, most likely. And also, the most teachable might be bridging the, the different cultural worlds of researchers and practitioners. So thank you very much. We're going to actually have a, a couple of other polls. Um, so can we move to that, please? So one more poll here. What experience do you bring to the webinar today? Have you taught or are teaching in a K-12 environment, conducting research? A lot of you seem to be conducting research in educational settings or doing both. Great. So we'd love to hear from you as you're listening to the presentations. We'd love to hear from you um, as you're bringing in experiences from both sides of the bridge, so to speak. OK, so let me introduce you to our two presenters. Um, our first presenter is Laura O'Dwyer, who is an associate professor in the Department of Educational Research, Measurement, and Evaluation 
at the Lynch School of Education, Boston College. There she teaches applied statistics and quantitative research methods to graduate students from multiple programs. While some students in her classes are preparing for careers in applied and developmental psychology and curriculum instruction, many of her students go on to become educational researchers at universities and research organizations such as EDC, AIR, and West Ed. Her research focuses on examining the organizational policy and practice correlates of student and teacher outcomes. Laura has worked with researchers at the Relney since 2006, publishing multiple reports that are aimed at policymakers and practitioners. And I have to say, from my perspective, Laura does a great job of explaining very complicated methodologies in lay people's language. We really appreciate that. Our second presenter is Gerald Buteau, who earned his Bachelor of Science in Elementary Education from Plymouth State College in 1986, and in Master's in Education in Guidance and Counseling from Plymouth State College in 1992. In 1998, he earned his EDD in Curriculum and Instruction from Boston University, where he studied with Dr. Kevin Ryan, an expert in the area of character education. Dr. Buteau is a former elementary classroom teacher and has been a professor at Plymouth State University for 24 years. At PSU, he teaches courses in curriculum development, instructional strategies, and literacy education. His area of research and scholarship is in literacy education. Dr. Bateau does extensive service work on several boards. He's a member of the New Hampshire Institutions of Higher Education. He's a past president and current member of the PSU Board of Alumni Directors, vice chair of the Moulton Borough School Board, past president and current member of the New Hampshire Association for Supervision and Curriculum Development, member of the New Hampshire Professional Standard Board, and he sits on the governing board of our Regional Educational Laboratory. And Jerry has been wonderful in really bringing the perspective of a practitioner, both from his experience as an elementary school teacher, as well as um, his work in teacher preparation. So we welcome both of them, and uh, we will start with having Laura Dwyer do her presentation first on her perspective from uh, teaching students who will become researchers, uh, educational researchers. Laura? Thank you, MP. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us today, and thank you, MP, for the very nice introduction um, to my work. Um, I'm delighted to be here today. Um, I have come to this discussion with what I consider to be three uh, relevant areas of experience. Uh, first, I am an educational researcher in quantitative methodology who works with schools, school districts, local education agencies, states, and sometimes countries uh, to look at the individual and organizational correlates of academic performance. So first and foremost, I'm, I'm an educational researcher, quantitative methodologist. Now second, as MP mentioned, um, I'm involved in the training and preparation of educational researchers. So I'm mostly involved with graduate level training where I prepare masters and doctoral level students to conduct quantitative research. Um, while I do train students in other programs, I consider uh, training educational researchers to be my primary focus. Um, and while some of my students do, in fact, go on to, be, to work at research organizations, many subsequently become faculty members in programs similar to mine. And then the third area of relevance here is that I have been working with researchers through the, the RELNI since 2006, and particularly in the second um, round of funding, the most recent one, um, there has been a shift that we have seen in other areas of funding toward making research that is um, actionable and producing studies and presenting findings in ways that are accessible to non-researcher audiences. So those are the, the areas in which I feel that are or the feel that are most relevant to, to this to the discussion today. 
Look, the field of education is really no different from any other evidence-based field in that innovations rely on timely, high-quality research that produces actionable findings. However, unlike some other fields, um, there's often a disconnect between those who do the research and those who might benefit from the research, such as teachers and their students. So essentially, the standard practice is for practitioners to be, to be trained to work on the front lines of education, and researchers are trained to conduct researchers on the practitioners who serve on those front lines. So there seems to be a, a disconnect here with the standard practice in, in how we're training researchers and perhaps in how we're training practitioners as well. So if you think about um, a field like the, the medical or the pharmaceutical industry, what we're doing is actually quite, quite different. So the disconnect here is that um, Researchers are typically trained in methods and analysis, but don't often receive training on how to work with practitioners or even policymakers. And practitioners often aren't prepared to work with researchers and to translate those research findings into actions. If you consider an analogy in, medi in medicine, um, in how we do things in education, things begin to, to break down here. So consider the hypothetical situation where you're either a medical researcher or a medical practitioner, but you weren't both, right? And what if medical researchers had trouble negotiating access to medical practitioners and their patients? And subsequently, what if medical practitioners didn't or couldn't access the results from studies in ways that translated into actions with their patients? So this is the, the, the challenge that we face in educational research, is that you, you have educational researchers who are trained in the methods. And they're often trying to negotiate access to teachers and their students. Uh, they also have the added complication often of requiring um, informed consent from the students of the teachers in whose classrooms they're working. So it's a lot more complex, and it's a lot more challenging to, to uh, negotiate this whole research practitioner partnership. So the result of the, the standard practice then is that we often have research being conducted that doesn't align with practitioners' needs or their interests or any important questions of policy or practice. Um, the research might be too broad to address any local or regional questions or problems. But we also do need broad research. We need global research that looks across large areas, so it's not just a local issue that we want to address, researchers often want to address larger and broader questions. Um, next, researchers are, must translate their studies, their, their findings, into um, interpretations that are accessible both, both to practitioners and to policymakers. And not just that they need to present them in a way that is easily accessible, they also need to find outlets where policymakers and practitioners can access this information, I mean literally access this information. Um, subsequent to this, if uh, researchers make their findings accessible to practitioners, it's often not possible for practitioners to take those findings and translate them into actions. So what we really need, what the field needs, is educational practitioners who can work, who can are prepared to work in partnership uh, with researchers. And the flip side of this is that we need researchers who are prepared to work in partnership with practitioners. And for this to happen, there needs to be a cultural shift around what is valued. So they need both types of programs must consider ways to pr pr promote the value of each other's roles. Now, as my experience is with um, programs that train educational researchers, that's really where I'm going to focus on. Um, but researchers need to be trained to work alongside practitioners. As we prepare educational researchers, 
probably the easiest thing for us to do is to prepare them to design rigorous research studies for addressing important issues in education. Right? That's the easy part. What's more difficult is to have them prepare them to, with these other considerations. So they must be able to work alongside practitioners in order to set research agendas and goals that are feasible and manageable given the available resources and that can be accessed both in terms of the content, the difficulty of the content and the translation of the content into real world implications um, and also in the outlets where the findings have been presented. Now one of the roadblocks to incorporating this type of, well, the type of preparation into research or training programs is the fact that communicating research findings in ways that are accessible to practitioners and policymakers isn't always valued um, in higher education. If you consider most of the, the faculty members I know around here, the, the currency of doing well in, in academia is to have peer-reviewed publications. And peer-reviewed publications are often the antithesis to practitioner um, publications. So what we have is a situation where researchers um, understand that what's valued in their field and at their institution, and that translates into how they train their researchers um, and training researchers to um, make their findings and their research accessible is not always valued as part of the program of studies for educational researchers. Now one of the things that researchers um, must do is negotiate discrepancies between what practitioners' interests are and the feasibility of conducting rigorous research. And in the poll that MP presented, I noticed that um, this, this came up, so being able to uh, balance the two and not just mutuality, but also coming up with ways in which the culture can be negotiated between what researchers need to do and what practitioners need from those researchers. So there is often a discrepancy between uh, what practitioners are interested and in, the feasibility of conducting useful research. And this is actually one of the great opportunities that educational researchers can have in building trust uh, and relationships with practitioners is to work through the goal setting and research agenda setting process. Um, I recently had an experience working with the English Language Learner Alliance uh, at RELNI where we worked with multiple states in the development of an instrument called the English Language Learner Program Survey for Principals. And the research team was based at, at RELNI. And we worked through the alliance members with state representatives, um, which involved multiple brainstorming sessions with alliance members and state representatives in setting goals and agendas around principals' roles in the education of English learners. And we worked together to translate the issues, the important issues that they identified, into researchable questions that then could be subsequently addressed through the development of this English language learner program survey for principals. Now it was a great experience because it was, and we've I've had multiple experiences through the REL with this. This was one of the, the most recent ones that comes to mind. Um, it was an opportunity for state and district leaders to work together along with side researchers to delineate what their research goals were, what the larger goals for their district and state were, were, and then how to move forward in the development of an instrument that could be used to collect data. In that partnership, um, as you would expect, the researchers were working, they led, we led the design of the study. And working with the practitioners, we were able to balance the purpose of the study with the feasibility of the study. Um, we were considering, well, what primary data should we be collecting? Is there secondary 
analyses that we can be, um, I'm sorry, secondary data that we can be working with instead of collecting primary data. So as I said, the, the researchers being trained to conduct research is probably the easiest part of this. So in my experience, um, this is one of the most tricky aspects of the partnership between research and practitioners. And it really is down to a cultural difference between what is expected and what the currency is in higher education, what is valued in the classrooms and the training of the researchers, um, and also perhaps a cultural issue around what um, practitioners and the, the, the documentation and the literature that practitioners prepare to read. Um, the, the recent focus on, for example, having this webinar talking about accessible findings or researchers making their findings more accessible is, is the importance of this is evidenced by current funding situations. So for example, um, the value of making research accessible to practitioners is underscored by IES's focuses, focus on grant funding opportunities that uh, those who receive funding uh, for doctoral and postdoctoral training programs embed within it opportunities to present their work and translate their work for practitioners and policymakers. And I think this is a really important step forward um, in, in how we think about training researchers. Obviously, there is a partnership here. So researcher practitioners must also be prepared to work alongside researchers. And this is really important given the unprecedented levels of accountability, where um, quantitative indicators of inputs and outputs um, are used for to meet federal and state mandates, et cetera. So as a nice segue to um, Gerald's presentation, we have to think about what pre-service practitioners should be prepared to do. So as an educational researcher and as somebody who trains educational researchers, um, it would be um, advantageous for pre-service practitioner programs to train practitioners to value the role of educational research, to understand the basics of research design and data analysis so that they can engage with researchers at all levels and all stages of the research. And then also work with researchers in translating research findings into actions. Laura, this is Rebby, and you and Jerry agreed nicely to be interrupted if there were clarification questions during the presentation. Yes. Um, and we do have a question. Yes, yeah, sure. Um, from Laura Wentworth, who asks, what, what does translate mean in this context? Is there a way that you can use a different um, a different set of words to, to make this a little bit more accessible, right on topic. <laughs> OK. Thank you for your question, Laura. Um, when I think about translate, I think about taking something, uh, taking findings that are perhaps a little bit abstract, perhaps quite broad or quite general, or perhaps relating to um, some other subpopulation or some other district type and then being able to transfer those findings and turn them into something that is actionable and some action, basically, at the school level or at the classroom level or the district level or the state level. Um, it's, it's similar to how what would happen in a medical study where researchers, medical researchers, find that a particular drug at a particular dose is effective. And then through training, the medical practitioner is able to translate that into what he or she um, passes along to patients in terms of information and dosage, et cetera. So with that, I'm actually going to pass over to, to Jerry. Um, I'm introducing Jerry Buteau. Um, and thank you all for your time. And I will be on the line and taking questions at the end. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everybody. I hope you can hear me well. Oh, <coughs> excuse me. It's a pleasure to be here chatting with you today. Um, well, I'm going to talk a lot. I appreciate the very kind introduction. My um, 
as MP said, my, my job here at Plymouth State University is really working with students who want to become elementary school teachers, uh, grades K through 6. We're a four-year um, teacher prep institution. Um, our four-year degree is a total of 120 credits um, for the program. We are nationally accredited. Um, and I bet, like uh, MP said, I've been here for many years doing this work and have uh, spent several years in the elementary school classroom prior to my work here, uh, particularly in primary grades. So I'm going to pick up where um, Laura left off and really thinking about uh, you know, how do we accomplish the things um, that we're trying to do. Um, so that they can be a strong collaboration between practitioners and researchers. I think a couple of themes are going to run through my conversation today, primary ones. And one of them is, I think what we're trying to do here at, at Plymouth in our program, and again, we're, we're a work in progress, as many programs are, is we're trying to develop, right from the beginning, a culture of inquiry. And the other thing is develop this notion of you know a, a disposition of curiosity. We want students to you know, think about things deeply, inquire. And I think a, a big part of that is, is starting at the very beginning of a teacher prep program with helping students understand what it means to ask the right question. So one of the things, as you can see, uh, developing critical thinking skills and identifying and using reliable research, those are very important to accomplishing the goals that, that we've set forth. Um, to begin, I'm going to kind of walk you through parts of our highlights of our program here at Plymouth, what we're doing, what we're, what we're trying to accomplish, and how we're trying to do that. The, uh, as you can see, I, I'm going to talk about our first year seminar, our introductory course of Childhood Studies, which are both in the first year of our program. I'm going to talk a little bit about our Human Development 1 and 2, which is in the sophomore year. And then Assessing Children in School comes in the junior year of their program. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about the summative assessment that we have, the teacher candidate assessment of performance when students are doing their final internship here. First of all, the, the first year seminar, the, really the purpose there is to is it says build students' repertoire of intellectual skills. We want them to draw connections between uh, across content areas, fields of knowledge, we want them to problem solve. We really want to teach them what it means to think critically. And one of the texts that we use that has been very helpful to that is a book called Asking the Right Questions, A Guide to Critical Thinking. It's by uh, Brown and Keeley. And we've used that for, I think I've been teaching the class now for eight years. And it really helps students understand you know, um, the assumptions underlying things, um, you know, reasoning, conclusions, evidence, really, really get them into that sort of, again, developing that culture of inquiry. Um, the first year seminar, for instance, I will use the, the course that I teach, my first year seminar, they're all based on a central question. My question that, that really shapes my first year seminar is what are the potential effects of organized sport on human development? Now, the question is such that there's, there's a lot of ways to look at it. Um, it's, we, examine, we spend the 16-week semester examining this question. We look at what the research says. We have guest speakers. We have experts in the field. We read studies from several sources. Um, we have debates. We really, again, helping them think about how to answer a question, developing those skills, and the research they turn up, how they can use that to inform their thinking. We also, it's co-taught with one of our university librarians who does a nice job at helping us locate valid and reliable research and how to sort of sift through what we consider really good sources and maybe you know, not so good sources. The second course in their first uh, year here at Plymouth is something called Introduction to Childhood Studies. Now, I've designed that course so that it, we use the framework um, Understanding by Design by Wiggins and McTighe. And we frame the course around essential questions, skills, and understandings. And what we've done in this class is we really try to focus on six major questions that, that guide the course. And we come back to these all the time. They really provide the framework. And I think they're rich questions that really, again, can help our students continue to inquire, to think, 
Um, the first question is what makes a good educator? Number two is we, we work with the question, how can technology effectively support teaching, learning, and assessment? The third question that frames this introductory course in Childhood Studies Elementary Ed is, what's the relationship between curriculum, instruction, and assessment? Number four, what's the relation between, relationship between education and society? Next, we examine what does learner engagement look like? And finally, how is reflective practice and professional growth linked? So with those questions, we read the research. We take a look at um, what are some of the ways in which we can answer these questions. And what we do is through the course of the semester, students have the opportunity to work as a team and select one of those questions and go into a, a fairly in-depth analysis and present their findings. So it continues, as I said at the beginning, building that culture of, of inquiry, um, being curious, taking a look at you know, what is reliable research, and continuing on uh, working on those goals. And as you can see on your slide, um, again, just a review of, of what we do and the presentation of that. And students are able to engage in some thoughtful conversation around that. They provide feedback and writing, which, which provides an opportunity for us to have a meaningful conversation around that. So by the time they've done their 16-week semester, they've been very focused. They've had their learning experience that's been very focused on a carefully selected and crafted set of questions. In their sophomore year, they take uh, two human development courses. And in those human development courses, one of the, the primary checks that we use in that course to continue this you know, culture of inquiry and critical thinking, we use the book, When Can You Trust the Experts, by Daniel Willingham. It really provides, I guess, the moral of that story or book is, how can we ask better questions about the research? Um, that, is being, that supports certain claims that are being made. The, uh, once students have had an opportunity to, you know, they're enrolled in that class, they, they do have an opportunity to con conduct, again, collaborative research with peers. Um, they have small group collaboration. They do identify a problem for study with the professor's guidance. They uh, conduct the study. They look at the data. They present their findings orally in, a, in presentations that faculty are invited to, to listen to and to give feedback. And they're also um, part of their requirement in that class is to create a website and on that website share um, their findings. And again, it, many faculty attend the presentations. And generally speaking, most of the time, if not all the time, a very rich discussion occurs. So that's in the sophomore year. In our junior year, and it's important to say here, I, in our program we have what's called a cluster model. So students, when they get into their second semester junior year, are what we call cluster one students. They are students that um, take the same courses their junior year. They sort of travel in packs, if you will. And there's been some good research to suggest the effectiveness of cluster and cohort models. And we do have that here at Plymouth. So students are able to develop strong relationships. Many of them have been you know, in the courses that I've talked about throughout their uh, time here at Plymouth. Now they're in courses such as assessing children in school. Um, we have courses, that, and this is when they start doing their clinicals in the junior year, the full day in, the, in an elementary school classroom. And so this particular class, assessing children in school, is we, want, we now are thinking that we want students to be able to develop some assessment literacy and effective use of data. Um, that's important as a practitioner. It also has very strong implications building, uh, supporting the relationship between practitioner and researcher. Um, we have one of our, one of several of our alumni who teach at our partnership schools come in and do a three to four hour workshop, data diving, if you will, where they present the assessment data, obviously, anonymously from various assessments they've given in their class, showing them you know, what kinds of assessments they're using, what kinds of data do they yield, and also you know, what do you do with that data? What does it mean? What is the application of that for instruction 
and individualization of instruction. And we've had that for, so we've started that probably oh, five or six years now. We've had that, and um, there's always a very uh, interactive, robust conversation. There have been years where along with the classroom teacher, um, the principal has come in, so he or she is able to add another first uh, perspective of how data is used in that school and what the expectations are of teachers when they come into the uh, to the school to teach. Um, as I mentioned on this slide, you can see that they do look at actual data, um, using it, working with it. And in addition, starting this fall, one of my roles, too, and it, and it helps me get a, 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 even a broader lens of, of teaching, learning, and education, is I've served as vice chair on my local school board here in Moultonboro for six years now. and. One of the things that, in my conversations with the administration, is I wanted to, to continue this. Once they get into cluster two, which there's their second semester, uh, excuse me, first semester senior year, we want to provide them with some more um, workshops around data literacy. But we've invited the superintendent and principal specifically this fall to put together a data literacy workshop. And uh, they are in the midst of doing that, and we're very excited, excited about rolling that out this fall. Finally, um, New Hampshire, I belong on uh, the Board of um, Institutions for Higher Education. There are actually 14 what I'm going to call IHEs here in New Hampshire. That includes some of the two-year programs. And so we have gotten together, it's probably about two years now, and started to meet uh, once a month to talk about what are we doing in our teacher prep programs. Now, we've also included in that conversation the New Hampshire State Board of Education and the commissioner, or Commissioner Barry, who's our commissioner here. So there's a lot of good collaboration going on around how are we preparing our teachers amongst the various stakeholders. And so those have been very rich discussions. So one of the things that we've developed here in New Hampshire is called the New Hampshire um, Teacher Candidate Assessment of Performance. Now, the TCAP has been around. Um, for a while, but we've sort of um, done our own revision of it to to meet our needs here in New Hampshire. And we're in our second year of doing that. Um, various subcommittees have been formed of our IHE board that are looking at um, the effectiveness of the New Hampshire TCAP. That are um, we've got some grant money to do some research on following teachers, our former undergraduates. We're now in the field. So a lot of really, I, I don't have time to go into detail right now, but a lot of interesting things are happening collaboratively around what sort of summative assessment should we provide for our students to get a good sense of what they can do. And the big part of that is, as you can see, is in the six weeks of student teaching, they, do, uh, they have a document, they have to document and analyze their performance, looking at the materials that they've developed. They have to be able to look at student work and uh, looking at uses of data. And students who are in this internship have seminars on campus, sometimes virtually, sometimes face-to-face, -face, where we coach them as they make their way through their um, TCAP experience. Um, they reflect their, on their own learning. Um, so a lot of good things happen as a result of that. So those are a few things that we do um, in our program. And I, and I want to reiterate that I think we realize that you know part of being able to bridge that gap between research that might exist between researchers and practitioners is helping students you know know what data looks like, be able to to understand it, to know what good research looks like, and really to formulate questions that will dig deep into our practice so that we can all improve. And again, part of that is learning the language of um, you know being able to have a shared language of both practitioners and researchers. Um, finally, uh, what, what we need to do, um, I think, you know, deepen the understanding of the connection between research and practice. One of the things I think we need to do um, in our seminar class is to make sure we bring back some of the things that we've been working with in their undergraduate program. Um, when can you trust the experts? Also a book called DataWise, which is we're going to start um, putting that into our seminar. Um, build a deeper understanding of how statistics can be used. Laura talked a little bit about that. It, 
to, to know it is one thing, but to be able to interpret it and to be able to use that in a way that, that both parties can understand is, is important. Problems of practice, we introduce students to that concept um, through various ways. I know that, um, in the I think it was Harvard newsletter in May, June 2009 was a good article on improving teaching and learning through instructional rounds. Um, as well as other sources that we use to help understand what a problem of practice is. And to use research skills independently and collaboratively with researchers to examine these problems of practice. Um, so I think, you know, as I said, a glimpse of what we're doing. Um, we're always looking to do better. And I think one of the ways we do that is by having conversations like this today and, and being as collaborative as we can. So thank you. Thanks to you both, um, Laura and Jerry. Uh, this is Rebby Carey again. And I wanted to remind folks that are in the um, audience, so to speak, to type any questions you might have for either Laura or Jerry in the chat room. But I wanted to ask both of you a question um, that came up in uh, the registration, which was, um, how, in your experiences, um, how can you sort of build the appetite for investing the time it takes to engage in collaborative research. I think what we've learned in the RHEL Northeastern Islands um, contract, and I, I hazard a guess that others have, have the same experience, it takes a lot more time to invest in these conversations together to really refine questions um, and to move forward and keep everybody sort of apprised of, of the work. Um, and it's a time-consuming process. So, Laura, I'm going to ask you first, what, what, is, what can we build in as incentives for this kind of um, investment of time? Yeah, thanks, Ruby. Um, I think it depends on who you're trying to incentivize at the time. Uh, for researchers, for example, um, it's a wonderful incentive for IES to build this into their um, funding. Uh, sources and their, their grant programs because that incentivizes the researchers to prioritize this type of training. So there's, there's that piece of it. The, the, um, but then on the other side, there's the, the benefit that practitioners can see through partnerships that are fruitful. And they are not always fruitful. It can often be the researcher comes, they do their research, or they do their research they leave, they get their publication in a journal article out of it, and the practitioner and their students don't get anything necessarily. Um, so I think it depends on, on who you're trying to incentivize here. I think structurally, I think that higher education programs that um, value non-technical articles uh, and publications in, in uh, in publications other than academic journals um, that could incentivize faculty to make their findings more accessible and actionable for practitioners. Um, Thanks, Laura. Um, Jerry, do you want to respond at all to that? Sort of what sure, sure. A couple of things I'll pick up on, and, and I hope I'm coming in, in OK. I want to pick up on, on, a, on a couple of things that Laura said. One of it, it has to be fruitful and, and sustainable. I, I think a, a drive-by, a quick, a, a quick sort of experience between practitioner and researcher that's not sustainable, that's not you know, entered with the idea that you know, we can do a lot of good work together. Um, again, as Laura said, it's not just about you know, doing a publication on the researcher side. It's about you know, how can we extend this relationship and really help teachers practice their craft better and ultimately, students learn more effectively. I, and I think that the idea, and I've had a few, couple of experiences, and they've been really, really um, meaningful, is when I go into schools and do work with classroom teachers, uh, and then we write, you know, we write the experiences, write about the experiences, and, and, and there's a publication that comes out of that. Incredibly empowering for, for practitioners, I think, has been my experience, to, you know, to work alongside, to, to sit down, and you know, write up, write the findings, and then you know, uh, be, being able to publish those to a wider audience. I think that's, a, that's very gratifying, and satisfying for for both practitioner and, and uh, university uh, people. Thanks, Jerry. 
We've got a question from Sara Mohammed who asked, um, do you see any solutions here, I'm, I'm guessing, to the, um, the overall preparation um, of education researchers and uh, soon-to-be practitioners that are scalable? Or does this have to be sort of a program-by-program program approach? Um, and he, um, Sorrow notes that even with these new um, funding mechanisms, that, that progress seems slow in, in building skills on both sides. Laura, do you want to? Sure. I think it will be slow. I think that everybody is entrenched. Uh, the status quo is probably the hardest thing to move. And it has been that way for a really long time. Um, but I do think that it will happen through sustained focus on this type of research and these types of partnerships. I think it may take a decade. It may take more. Um, but I don't think that three years is long enough to, to see anything. Even if you consider the pipeline for submitting articles for publication, um, if you're publishing with your teachers, the teachers who are part of your study, either a journal article or a book. These things take many years to come out. Um, very, very slow pipeline. So we're looking at a, a scale of change that is much slower than in other fields, perhaps. Um, but I do think it will happen. These types of incentives and with IES programs, with the new Spencer Foundation programs, I think that it will happen. You know, and just to add, I, and I think there are, uh, you know, uh, Laura, absolutely. The, the, the only thing I might add to that, too, is it, it is slow. But well, I think once once people see, readily see what can happen as a result of this and seeing what sort of, you know, things we can do for teaching and learning, then, then I think you're going to continue to see even more activity and excitement around it. I don't know what to say about the slow bar. You know, that I don't have an answer to. But... Typically, when people, when, when these things are, you know, when they're published and, and people say, well, these are, these are the kinds of really good collaborations we can do, um, the tendency for others to jump on board, I think, increases as a result of that. Thanks. Um, there was a question that was submitted in the um, registration um, that talked about um, best practices for gaining buy-in from teachers that researchers and program evaluators are not in this kind of work to punish them or threaten them, that we, I'm assuming this came from a researcher, are attempting to use their experience and expertise to advance local understanding of how to improve educational systems. So is there, some, I, think, I think all the conversation that we've had here today about building a better foundation between researchers and practitioners at the earliest level, I think will help that. And I think Laura and Jerry are right that it might be slow. But are there some things that you've seen that sort of makes this bridging of cultures a little bit easier from the get-go? Um, I would like to um, endorse what Jerry just said about um, publications and opportunities for presentation. Um, I was in speaking to a colleague earlier. I was He was submitting a contract for a book with the teachers, the practitioners with whom he has been working for four years through the school. So their opportunities like that are very, very valuable to teachers. Um, my graduate students and I have submitted uh, um, proposals to present at national conferences with the superintendent and the data coordinator at the district that we work with locally. So there are teachers and practitioners to engage in the entire research process. And again, we have this cultural thing, whereas um, publishing in practitioner journals might not be valued by institutions of higher education. Similarly, you're seeing something in schools and districts where publishing a book or presenting at national conferences might not be valued yet. But I think that we can change that, and I think it will take time, though. Well, you, you know, I just a couple things to add on to that. And I'm going to sort of put my school board hat on here for a second. And, and I, I think what we could probably do a better job at, at the, at the administrative level, the board level, at public schools, at least in my area I can speak for, is to do a better job of encouraging teachers 
to, and, and providing them with some incentive, even if it's you know time with the researchers to collaborate around these very important and recognize the importance that teachers not that you know what they do in the classroom is, is you know amazing, and we know what good teachers do, but also we helping them understand the value of doing the work we're talking about and providing incentives via time to work with the researchers, giving them an opportunity to do that more. And I think if the administration and, and boards can can understand that and and pr provide some sort of incentive, then maybe it's just you know more time to collaborate. It would go a long way. And, and the other thing is we've seen here in New Hampshire, we have a here at Plymouth State, we have a, a New Hampshire Journal of Education where we publish um, articles from practitioners. They're very, they're very much, uh, you know, as Laura was talking, and, and, and the excitement and enthusiasm of, of being published in a journal, a practitioner journal, is a great way to begin and a great way to help um, teachers understand and, and appreciate the work that they do. Um, and, and to generate, a, a, like I said, interest and excitement and motivation around that. So I think that's those are some very important points. Thanks, Jerry and Laura. Um, we've got a question in the chat from Carrie that says, "What's the grant fl funding climate relative to practitioner researcher work?" And I'm going to throw a curveball in here, and I'm going to ask. Um, and oh, I'm sorry, I misunderstood what MP was gesturing to me about in the room. I apologize. Um, did you want to reply to the question that was just asked? I'm sorry, Carrie, we'll do, get to your question in one second. Um, you're on mute, though. <laughs> Thanks, Rebby. Um, I just wanted to share an experience, a very real experience that we had with one of our um, members on the English Language Learners Alliance to this question of, at first, our request to do research in this one district and using ELLA data, English Language Learners data in that one district came across as, um, well, what if the findings are negative? It's going to reflect on me as, as, a, as a director. It's going to reflect on the programs that we have and so on. And, and the higher ups will not be happy with it. And so it really took a lot of trust. And if you remember, one of the challenges that was presented uh, earlier on is really this need to build trust around how the data will be used and for what purposes. But fortunately, um, the director in that district went ahead and let us um, share the data with us, and we did the study. And actually, it's been a very positive experience um, in that district. Even before the final findings were released, um, they began to think about how they might improve their programming for English language learners. Um, the way we presented the findings to the administration they, uh, the director began to see that we were not out there as a gotcha kind of thing, but really, so what does this say about the kind of improvement that you need to be thinking about in the district? So it turned out to be a very positive experience, so much so that this district wants to enter into a partnership with us just to do research on their district. So that piece of building trust is really important, and I can't emphasize it, it, it really is something that needs to be paid attention to. So even if starting with small kind of projects, just so they, the, your practitioners begin to see that there's a benefit to them and that it's not going to be used against them is really important. Thanks, MP. So um, we've just got about two minutes left, and I'm going to um, close this with asking you to fill out a survey. But before that, I I did respond, Carrie, to your question about the grant funding climate relative to practitioner researcher work in the chat. Um, but I would invite Laura or Jerry to add anything. Um, Laura mentioned a few examples of um, IES funding mm -hmm. with the researcher practitioner grants. I, um, NSF has had some collaborative research um, grants um, recently awarded. Um, the, the foundation funding, it just seems to be talking a little bit more about that, uh, just the importance of the the collaboration between those in the field and those who research those in the field. So um, I think it's 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 a, a growing a little, little bit larger. Quickly, Laura or Jerry, do you need any? Want to um, add anything to that? Right. Uh, just one more point, and that is the um, IES predoctoral 
interdisciplinary research training program for institutions to train researchers, uh, quantitative methodologist researchers who are both interdisciplinary and have the skills necessary to work with practitioners and policymakers. So that was the only other one that I wanted to mention. Thanks, Laura. Well, thank you all, Laura and Jerry and all of you, for hanging out with us for this hour to talk about preparing um, educators and researchers to better get across that sturdy bridge that MP showed us. And have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you, Rebby. Um, thank yeah. you, MP. Thank you. Thank you. On behalf of REL Northeast Nouns, thanks so much, everyone, for joining us today. In two or three weeks, you'll receive a thank you email from us with a link to today's webinar archive. And we appreciate your completion of the feedback survey. Have a great evening.